Christoph Grab, you are professor for uh, experimental physics at ETH Zurich, and uh, you are coordinating the computing infrastructure for the Swiss particle physics at LHC. What are the scientific questions you want to answer? Well, one of the big, big scientific questions that we try to answer is fundamental physics. We're really trying to understand the fundamental laws of physics that govern the structure of uh, space, time and matter as well. That means at the moment really the hot topics are what is the origin of mass? Why do we have mass? Where does it come from? But then also if you look around we're all made of matter and at some point in the past there was an equality between matter and antimatter. So at some point there was an asymmetry created and we want to understand why this happened. Moreover if you look at the, at the universe then at the moment, you only understand something like 4% of the universe, of the energy density in the universe. So these are big, big questions which we have not answered yet. And in order to do so, we have a new machine, which is this LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. And there we are trying to solve some of the, these questions. The field is the particle physics, and particle physics itself has at the moment one big standard model, a theoretical model, that describes basically all we know. But we know it has deficiencies. And if you look at the model itself, the model basically consists of a, a list of particles, I mean building blocks, how it is all made out of. Then it has some theoretical mathematical formula that tells you how these things interact with each other. Mm -hmm. And for the interaction you have the forces that mediate between the different uh, matter blocks. So this is the standard model. And in order to find out now these additional questions, we want to scrutinize this model and see, does it have holes? Is it incomplete? Because we know this model cannot describe, for instance, where the mass comes from. Right? So we want to investigate that. And for this, we have this big machine, LHC, which gives us access to a complete new energy range. We have big detectors. We have collaborations. There are four collaborations at the LHC, where Swiss physicists are involved in three of them. This is ATLAS, CMS and LHCB. And I am a member of the CMS collaboration, so examples I show will be biased towards CMS, naturally. Uh, the collaboration is something like three and a half thousand people. The results coming out, of course, is then the product of a collaboration, I mean, of working together in groups, in analysis groups, in physics groups and so forth. So it's not the result of individuals at the end. Of course, still, genial very good ideas from single person can make a big, big impact. Right? And the particle physics community just had two important conferences. What are the most important results? Before we actually come to the, to the results in detail, I want to show you just a few things that we actually measure, which then will be analyzed to produce these results. This is an example from CMS where we see different jets from a collision. Remember, we collide protons from left and protons from right, they collide in the center of the screen here and produce a spray of particles. And these spray of particles are jets, and from these particle sprays, we reconstruct what has happened at the time of interaction. Then you look at many, many of these events, and from these events, then you make the new results. So I'll show you a few examples, which uh, in this case is the decay of a Z boson going to E plus C minus, where it's very clean, very clear. But it's not always like that. I mean, we have events which look much more complicated, where it's a big, big, big uh, lightning like a Christmas tree, and you have to find out what happens. Right? So many of them are happening. Moreover, in the last month or so, we have a machine which runs fantastically. We have, in one collision, many, many interactions taking place. So you have to take them apart. That makes it more complicated. So to come back to the results, I show you here one very important measurement, which is a candidate event for a so-called B sub S decay into mu plus B minus, which is a very rare decay. So we're looking for rare phenomena. We're looking for things that have not been measured before. So just to start with, as a result, I will show you the, <coughs> actually the luminosity. That's the measure of how well the machine runs. It was fantastic over the years, over the last year. So we have measured in this case looking for the Higgs, as you probably have seen from everywhere or read, you have not seen the Higgs yet, unfortunately. 
but we have been able to exclude certain ranges in mass. And if you look at the screen here, we see the mass range of the Higgs. This starts at around 100 GD, in this case up to 600 GD. That's a distribution measured by CMS. And the red line indicates where we would expect this, the Higgs to come in, in terms of rate, if the standard model were true as we know it. Since we have not seen it, we can exclude certain ranges, in this case just basically all the ranges which are below the red line. That's a range in mass where we can say with 95% confidence level that the Higgs is not there. So these have been measured and you see this is a zigzag line, so various regions have been excluded. But there's still windows left on the right where the Higgs could be. Right? So this is a measurement by CMS and of course Atlas has done similar measurements excluded similar regions. So all over at the end, just the range between 100 and, the, and about 140 GB is really the most promising one that remains. So we'll continue, of course, looking for that. But then, of course, not just looking for Higgs. We've also done standard model measurements, right? You have to understand the detector in detail. So you use processes that we know, like j production. And then you look if the dependency on the transverse momentum is what we expect from models. So understanding the standard model process is an important issue because it's the background for your searches. Then, of course, we have measured the top quark, which has been elusive and only produced in the US for a long time. So we measure, for instance, its mass, how often it is produced, if it's single produced, if it's double produced. And we have scrutinized that already in detail. Then we have looked at other models. We know one of the major or of the important models which could give a solution out of the problem is the Higgs is the supersymmetric models. And in this case, in the events, you would very often observe so-called missing energy. That means in a part of the region of the detector, you don't see energy where you would expect some energy. So there's something missing. And this missing could be due to particles, supersymmetric particles that we have not been able to measure. So there are many, many different searches and the search for SUS is quite complicated. It very strongly depends on the final state. If you look for leptons, if you look for jets, and so forth. And usually this is then expressed in a two-dimensional plot where you just have exclusion limits in terms of masses of two masses here. Uh, we have not seen a signal, otherwise I would show you very happily a signal. And from this you again exclude certain ranges in the phase space for the SUSE models. Now this is a very busy complicated plot, but punchline is the more and more we look at it, it's getting, well, as somebody put it, air is getting thin, but this is only true for a very simple mind in SUSE models. But nevertheless, it is a region, we are excluding more and more regions in the phase space. So this is one of the things that we can look at. Now, beyond the standard model, there are many, many possibilities of models, right? So just to give you an example, we've looked for SUSE models, and the lower limit that we see now is something of the order of 1 TV but we could have additional gauge bosons. And there we have limits of the order of 2 TV, or you could have even excited quarks. That means real quark states which are excited. And the mass limit that we reach now is something like 3 TV. So that means they have to be heavier than that. Otherwise, we would have seen them. And on top of that, we have many, many other things. And of course, we will continue running, right? So instead of going through all the different results that we have, I'll just show you the plan for the next few years, so you get an impression. LHC we run through 2012, that's just a, a draft plan, so it's not yet approved. But then we will get the shutdown in 2013, right? then we will continue running for a couple of years, and there will be another big shutdown in 2018, right? and then we will continue. During this period, the detectors will upgrade, they will put in new detectors, um, make fixes, whatever. But it means that the whole thing is a 10 to 15 year plan, right? It's not an experiment that just runs for one year and then it's over. So we would not expect to have resolved all the big questions which I've mentioned at the beginning within just half a year. So one has to be stayed tuned for a couple of years because that's really a long range program. This is a huge uh, research project with researchers from many nations. What is the specific contribution from Swiss researchers? We have basically all major universities involved. Now I can just, for instance, list that in CMS, 
the ETH Zurich and PSI and University have contributed very strongly to the PSI, uh, to the central silicon tracker that has been constructed, the barrel pixel for CMS, but then a huge contribution by ETH in the construction of the electromagnetic accelerator for CMS. Then we have, for instance, the University of Zurich, which contributes for LHCB in terms of trigger and silicon detectors. Bern and Geneva, they contributed to the trigger in Atlas. So they're in the Atlas collaborations. They're, I would say Swiss University is very strongly involved. And they have a very strong uh, voice also in the collaborations. Then you should not forget management issues, right? We have people who are in very important positions within the experiments, like uh, physical coordination, spokesperson, then uh, coordinators for different physics analysis groups, technical groups, and so on. And of course, in terms of analysis, right, we work within the big groups, within the big analysis groups. And we, you speak about uh, analysis, the next question would be, do we have consensus everywhere or do you have hot topics? Well, the hot topics, of course, still are mass. Do we find the Higgs or do, don't? If we don't find it, then there has to be something else in this uh, energy domain. It may be some supersymmetric model, it may be something completely different, which we don't know yet. So the search is going on until we really have resolved that. We know that within this energy domain, there has to be something new. This is very well known and established from a theoretic point of view. This has to happen. What it is, we just don't know. Right? As physicists, you are working with probability. And how big is the probability we find something before we switch off the system in 2013 or will happen after 2000s in the time period 2014-17 about, for example, the X particle? Well, if the, the machine continues to run as well as it did so far, let's say in the half, last half year, then by the end of 2012, we certainly have enough statistics to be able to tell if the standard model Higgs, as we know, exists in that range or not. Still, there could be, of course, different Higgs models, extended Higgs models or supersymmetric Higgs models that could escape our mass range. But this will allow us to tell if the mass window between the LEP limits of the order of 115 GV and the present limits from LHC of the order of 140 GV, if the Higgs lives within that range or not. That means we have to, we will be able to close these windows. And this means what will you, will you be doing in the next months until at the end of 2012? We have been involved in our group with the search for Higgs decaying to beauty quarks, because beauty is one of the things that we are experts in. We have been doing measurements with beauty for quite a while. And beauty is one of the very important measurements of the background contribution for all the other searches. So we will continue our contribution to the Higgs decaying to BB bar. And this is a very promising decay because the B is heavy and the Higgs likes to couple to very heavy particles. So if it is light, it has a very high probability to decay into BB bar. So we are at the forefront there. We hope, of course, we will be happy, but time will tell. Okay. And uh, for this uh, LHC experiments, we know you need a very large infrastructure to analyze a lot of data which is produced every second uh, from the different uh, instrument to from the different de detectors can you des just describe us what infrastructure you have to analyze this data and uh, what system are deployed in switzerland well if you go back to the experiments then each of the experiment writes of the order of 100 to 500 megabytes per second on tape and this amount of data gives you per year something like 10 to 20 petabytes. And this has to be analyzed. So we have a hierarchical structure set up that allows to take the data, store the data, and then redistribute it to different centers in a very hierarchical manner all over the world. That requires, of course, very good networks, requires good collaboration among the different centers and the good uh, organization. And this has happened, the whole structure has been set up in sort of levels or tiers, where tier zero is a CERN, that's where you store the data, you reconstruct them, and then you distribute them to bigger computing center like uh, Karlsruhe or INFN or the US centers in Brookhaven or Fermilab. And then from these centers, you can further distribute the data to the tier twos, which are on the country level, like we have our center in uh, Malmö, basically at the CSCS. And 
that's our main working horse for doing analysis and for doing Monte Carlo production. And then attached or using the transfer of data from the tier twos, we have the tier threes, which are sitting at the universities. For instance, CMS has its own CMS tier three computing center, which sits at the PSI, which is the Power Sharing Institute, which is done for the Swiss CMS physicists where it serves for the final state analysis. So the last part of the analysis is done there. So this whole structure allows us to really deal with this huge amount of data, right? And in order to do, to do that, we had to write our own software, which is not uh, just uh, off the shelf. And of course, we hope that eventually this software will help to provide more knowledge and tools to other communities. So we know that other communities also will have to promise large data sets. This in, is an inherent problem to many of the sciences, more and more. And since the high-energy physicists have mastered the way to handle this data, I think they can profit from our knowledge. And that's what we're trying to do. So within the so-called EGI, the European Grid Initiative or Infrastructure, we will help to promote and uh, pass on our knowledge how to treat large data sets to other communities, other sciences. I think in the long term this will be a very successful model. It may not end up in the same way that we are doing grid computing. It could be something which is linked to cloud computing or virtualization. I think at the end everything will be intermingled and uh, interchangeable. Right? But that's the ultimate goal. So you have one set of one framework where everybody can really profit from the knowledge. We can in that case say that uh, the science is supported by high performance computing that is really part of the science like the, the detectors you have uh, can uh, assume you the community gets a Nobel Prize for the results they will get. Uh, can you say how much the percent uh, of the Nobel Prize will be dedicated to supercomputing? Oh, that's a very difficult question. I mean. First of all, I doubt that in this context it's easy to give out the Nobel Prize because it's a huge community. I mean, there are thousands of people working, right? So you cannot give a Nobel Prize to a thousand of people. The limit is three. So, <laughs> or it could be an organization. That's a different story. So in that sense, of course, it's not possible to answer that question. But without the new computing infrastructure, this supercomputing, high performance, high throughput computing, we could not really do all this analysis anymore. Right? I mean, the times that you sit down and have your paper and just make the diagrams is over, not with this amount of data. So this is by now an integral part of the experiment. It has to be taken and sort of acknowledged as such. Yes. Thank you very much, Christoph Grab. You're very welcome.